but thank you for being here. Um, and so again, this is maybe, maybe the last talk we have of this session, um, which is great because we're actually in for a treat, so it's a great talk to finish on. Um, but before I get to introducing our speaker, the other thing I wanted to mention, this is a little bit sad, but most, many of you may have seen or uh, know George Abbey. So George Abbey is also, you can go listen to his talk on, on this lecture series. It's hard to explain how influential George was with the space industry, for those of you who knew him. He was a, he was a space policy expert here at uh, our Baker Institute for Public Policy. He was the director of the Johnson Space Center. He shepherded through the Russian uh, uh, Apollo Soyuz, not the Apollo Soyuz, but the, the, he worked with, with the Russians to help us work with the space station. He helped create the, uh, the, the space shuttle program. He brought more people from different backgrounds into the, into the astronaut pool. I, and he started, even started the Scottish Space School, if you can believe that. Ooh. So the guy was amazing. And unfortunately, he passed away just roughly about 10 days ago. Um, it's hard to know what that's going to mean for a lot of us in the space community. But I thought at least, without trying to bring everybody down, I thought I would at least acknowledge the man who was here you know, uh, tonight. Because again, if you don't know anything about him, there's a book that was kind of co-written for him called The Astronaut Maker. And that will tell you, there's a great picture, I was telling someone about this earlier, there's a great picture with uh, two astronauts, I think from the Apollo era, I think, um, can't remember who they were, but they're walking along the gangway, and behind them there's a, a small guy in a suit, and one of the astronauts is a sign with an arrow pointing to the left that says, unnamed NASA official. <laughs> and that unnamed NASA official was Mr. Abbey, as the astronauts were forced to call him. Um, so a, a great guy, that, a great guy for the whole world. We wouldn't be where we are today in the space program without George Abbey, and he's no longer around. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And now, I'm very happy to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, there's a lot of things we talk about in space, from hardware to software to science to exploration. Um, this kind of covers a little bit of all of that. Um, and some of the work that Kelly's done. So I'm going to read you, when I ask our speakers for a brief bio, usually I have to edit it. Kelly gave me a brief bio, so I'm just going to read it. So thank you for that, Kelly. So Dr. Kelly Winnersmith received her PhD in ecology at the University of California, Davis. My wife got her PhD there too. Oh, cool. And is an adjunct faculty member here in the biosciences department. Kelly studies parasites, no comment. <laughs> uh, studies parasites that manipulate the behavior of their hosts and her research has been featured in The Atlantic, National Geographic, BBC World, Science and Nature. Um, when she isn't studying nature's creepiest wonders, Kelly's writing books with her husband, Zach Wiener-Smith, who is the creator of the Saturday Morning Breakfast serial comics. Their books, Soonish and A City on Mars, are New York Times bestseller. And The City on Mars is the theme of tonight's talk. So please join me in welcoming <clears throat> Kelly. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It's a real honor. Uh, so my husband and I started writing A City on Mars because we had just finished writing this book called Soonish. And while writing Soonish, we ended up being convinced that space settlements were just around the corner. So we had a chapter on how SpaceX was rapidly dropping the cost of sending mass to space. We had another chapter on asteroid mining and how space resources can be used to make space settlements. And after spending a bunch of time talking to space advocates, they convinced us that space settlements are coming soon, just like Musk said. The main thing that is holding us back is that we just have not yet been able to afford to send all the equipment that we need for space settlements up into space, but soon we should be able to do that, and the equipment we don't send will be able to you know, make using resources in space. So my husband and I set out to write a book about how we're going to be settling space in like the next decade, and here's the stuff that we need to do to get there. And about two years into the writing process, our editor was like, guys, you clearly don't think space settlements are coming soon. Write a new, pick a new thesis, start your book over again, accept that you've changed your mind, and uh, that's what I'm talking to you about tonight. Uh, so after four years, we ended up deciding space settlements still sound kind of cool to us. We're still sci-fi geeks. We still get excited about NASA's exploration missions. I didn't cry, have not cried much in my adult life, but I cried when NASA landed Curiosity on Mars. So I remain excited about space, but I would like to see us take space settlement slowly. But when you talk to space advocates, they're often pushing for settling space rapidly. And usually their arguments for why we need to do it fast are because there are some amazing benefits, and as our Earth, you know, as our planet is going down the tubes, as they often argue, 
We need these benefits as soon as possible. So let's talk about some of these benefits. Uh, so one of, oh, there we go. So one of the benefits you hear about a lot uh, is, is associated with this, this idea called the overview effect. And I believe in what I think of as a like, sort of soft version of the overview effect, which is that looking at the Earth from space is a profound experience, probably quite moving. Uh, but then there's a version of the overview effect that I think of as the strong argument for the overview effect. And that argument is that after viewing Earth from space, you are profoundly changed in a way that sticks with you and that we need as many people to go to space as possible because they're going to acquire the wisdom of sages. And when you go to space, you don't see borders anymore. So you realize that all of our problems are created by, by, our, by us. You don't have to have these problems. They're man-made problems. Uh, and that the Earth is a very delicate planet. But when you start digging into the overview effect, uh, one of the first things you notice is that you can see borders from space. Uh, you can see the border between Pakistan and India, for example. And you can also see, this, so it's the light. The border is all lit up so it can be patrolled. Uh, and you can also see the border between things like North Korea and South Korea. And if you couldn't see the border, just because you can't see the border doesn't mean that the people living on the northern side of that border aren't very strongly feeling like they are in a bad situation. And so I, I, we ended up deciding that one, you can see borders, and two, not being able to see borders isn't actually helpful because there's real problems on Earth that need to be dealt with and not seeing borders doesn't make them go away. Also, there was an, a, a survey that was given to astronauts and cosmonauts that had recently come back from space, and that survey was also given to moms who had recently given birth. And they had very similar survey responses showing that these are both very profound, life-changing experiences. But I've been to PTA meetings with other moms, and I really like other moms, but I don't think that the world, you know, the world clearly still has problems. And there are like moms at PTA meetings who get very mad. These profound experiences don't keep us from fighting. Uh, so I wasn't, I'm not super convinced that we need to go to space in the near term because of the overview effect. You also get people arguing that we need to go to space because uh, this is how nations learn to cooperate. And this is why I feel like a wet blanket a lot when I talk about space. But, you know, I think you can easily make the argument that we cooperate in space when we're getting along already, not that going to space is what makes us cooperate. You know, when we did the Apollo Soyuz project, that was a thaw in the Cold War. And when we started building the International Space Station together, that was a time when Russia didn't feel like a threat anymore. And even though in the last you know, 20 plus years we've invested so much money in the International Space Station that this is now the most expensive human-made object ever, that didn't give us the ability to cooperate with Russia and keep them from invading Ukraine. Uh, so I, I think space and international collaboration is beautiful, but, but I'm not convinced that we need to settle space uh, because it's going to solve any problems here on Earth. Uh, folks also argue that space resources will stop or eliminate, either eliminate or have us pull back on war. And the argument here is that war is about resources or land. Uh, and that if we, we go out into space, there'll be unlimited resources, unlimited land. We're not going to need to fight anymore. That sounds great. But uh, we talked to scholars who study causes of war. And they said that there's no reason to think that that would actually be the case. And that war is often not about resources or like square footage, you know? So if you go to uh, Putin and you're like, all right, Crimea, we don't need to fight about this anymore. We'll give you a similar amount of square footage in Antarctica and we'll all be cool. Like usually fighting is about particular pieces of land that we have like cultural attachments to and it's not just about square footage. Uh, so I, I wasn't particularly convinced by any of those arguments for why we need to go fast. So now let's talk about the arguments from the two most famous space advocates in our generation, and they happen to be the two uh, richest men on the planet. So Jeff Bezos is carrying the torch for Gerard K. O'Neill. He's a physicist who was really excited about rotating space stations. And these are, in my mind, the most beautiful visions of space stations. Like, it does, it looks like it would be super cool to live in one of these habitats. And so the idea is that there's so many resources in space that you could build enough of these rotating stations to house billions, maybe even trillions of people. And you can get these stations to rotate and simulate Earth's gravity, or maybe even slightly lesser than Earth's gravity, if it's all that, that's all that we turn at, turns out that we need to develop normally. Uh, and Bezos is excited about this because, for two main reasons. One, he argues we can move humans off Earth 
to space, and that will help with our overpopulation problem. And he also argues that we can move heavy industry to space, and then Earth can be zones like residential and light industrial. So our pollution and our overpopulation, we can outsource those problems to space. And like technically, maybe that will work eventually, but when you start to think about the numbers, it just it's hard to imagine how the, this sort of technology could come about in time to help us while the implications of global climate change are already being felt by so many people. So for example, if you wanted to just tread water on current population sizes, you'd need to move 200,000 people to space every day. So you'd need 200,000 volunteers, you'd need spacecraft that could send 200,000 people up into space, and then you need housing for those 200,000 people, and we don't know how to do those things yet. So maybe one day this will help alleviate some of the pressure we're putting on the Earth, but I don't see it as a near-term solution. Uh, and to be honest, the argument that I found most compelling was uh, Elon Musk's argument, which I almost hate saying out loud. But anyway, uh, so Musk is really excited about uh, having a plan B for humanity. So the idea here is that uh, you want a backup, so that if something catastrophic happened to Earth, then you would still have humans living somewhere else. And so this, you know, human experiment could go on. And like, history notwithstanding, I like people, so I feel like it would be good if we did have a backup of humans somewhere. But the problem is this is another thing that we can't do quickly. So in order to have a self-sustaining settlement on Mars, you would need to have everything on Mars that's required to live, for them to live for the rest of their lives. So if, if Earth is destroyed, that means no more resupply ships. So you're not gonna get any more uh, computer chips, you're not gonna get any more food deliveries. So you need to be able to be completely self-sustaining. And I looked for estimates for how many people that would take, and some people said as low as like a million, some said something like 10 million, but for reasons we're gonna discuss uh, throughout the rest of this talk, I don't think we are yet prepared to support a million people on Mars, and I think if we rush into trying to get a million people on Mars, there could be some pretty negative uh, implications of rushing. There was one other argument that my husband and I initially thought was pretty good, uh, and the argument is not a beautiful one, it's essentially, Settling space is awesome, and who has a right to stop you? And so we ended up calling this the hot tub argument. Uh, the idea being, oh, where did my hot tub slide go? The idea being essentially that, oh, hot tub slide's gone. All right, so my husband and I, if we decided that we wanted to get a hot tub, our neighbors might not like that. It might not be very attractive for them to see, but they really have no right to stop us from getting a hot tub. So the question is, is going to space like having a hot tub in your backyard an awesome thing that no one has a right to tell you to not do? Or is it more like having a nuclear weapon in your garage where someone has a right to tell you that you can't have it because you owning it puts them at risk? So we'll return to this at the end of the talk. We'll try to figure out where space settlements fall on that, on that gradient. Okay, so Musk, who wants this, mil wants his, this million person settlement, he'd like to see it put on Mars. And Mars, you know, like space is pretty miserable, really. And Mars is like the best place in space where you could put a settlement. And it's got some major perks. So it's about has about a 24 hour day night cycle. So pretty close to Earth. Around the equator, the temperature is pretty nice. It's got water at the poles. It has water at the equator too, if you're willing to dig down a bit. Uh, it's got a bunch of the stuff that we'd need to grow plants. It has a carbon dioxide atmosphere, which doesn't sound great, but that's a good source of carbon and oxygen when you break that apart. So it's got most of the stuff that we need to survive, and with the right equipment, you could imagine humans creating a self-sustaining settlement on the planet. But it's got some cons also. So uh, the atmosphere is 1% of what we have on Earth, and that 1% atmosphere uh, is too thin for you to be able to go outside without a spacesuit on, but it's thick enough to support dust storms that cover the entire planet and sometimes can exist and pop up for like weeks at a time. So you're gonna have to worry about your solar panels if that's your main power source. And most of the proposals we read about included bringing uh, portable nuclear reactors with you. And those are still in development, uh, but that's gonna be tough. The dirt that's getting sent all over the planet also has chemicals in it. So it has perchlorates, which are endocrine disruptors. They mess with your thyroid hormones, which control things like uh, heart rate and blood pressure. So you're gonna have to worry about that. And additionally, we know that if you grow plants in soil with perchlorates, plants take up those perchlorates. So you're gonna need to make sure that you're not getting that stuff in your food. 
Uh, another problem is that Mars is pretty far away. So because of orbital mechanics, you can only leave for your trip to Mars almost every, about every two years. If you wait every two years, there's a window where if you launch from Earth, you can catch up to Mars. It still takes somewhere around six to nine months, depending on what kind of uh, technology you're using to get there. Then you have to stay on Mars for about a year, and then it takes about six to nine months to get back. There are some different proposals, but those time frames are the most common ones that we came across. So this means that if you make it to Mars and then something catastrophic happens to your equipment, there's probably not going to be a resupply that's going to be able to get to you on time unless it's already shipped from Earth. So you're on your own. This also means there's going to be communication delays. So uh, at closest distance, it takes about three minutes to get a message from Earth to Mars and about 22 when they're the most far apart. So if you have a medical emergency, you're not going to be able to get live input. But you know, when you're only three minutes away, it's not going to be delayed quite, not going to be delayed that much. Uh, another problem is that Mars is farther away from the sun than Earth, so you're going to get a little bit less sunlight. That's OK. You just need to plan on bringing some more solar panels, but you'll have to plan for that. Oh, there's my hot tub slide. Well, that's too bad. Yeah, see, not a very attractive proposal. But really, does anyone have a right to stop us? Uh, all right. So now let's talk about some of the problems that I think stand in the way of being able to actually start a settlement now, some of the things that are going to make things complicated. So first of all, uh, human bodies just don't do well in a vacuum. So whenever you move from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure, you risk the nitrogen that's in our blood coming out of solution and forming bubbles. Uh, this is sort of like what happens when you have a uh, liter of, for example, Di Dr. Pep or Diet Pepsi. It's under a lot of pressure. When you take off the cap, the pressure equalizes with the outside, and the, you get you know you get soda shooting out. But if you were to open it uh, under the sea at a high pressure area, first of all, that Diet Pepsi would probably taste no worse. Uh, but second, it, well, you wouldn't get the bubbles coming out of solution because you're in a high pressure environment as long as it matches the pressure in the two liter bottle. So if you step out into the vacuum of space, nitrogen comes out of your blood. And if it ends up in your joints, you get what's called the staggers. If it ends up in your lungs, you get the chokes. And if, you end up, if it ends up in the nervous system, you get, uh, no, that's when, you, that's when you get the staggers. But if, it, if this happens to you in space, you're probably just going to get the death, which unfortunately is what happens to uh, the first cosmonauts to visit a space station. So this was the crew of Salyut 3 uh, when they were ex or when they were separating from the Salyut 1 capsule in their uh, spacecraft, one of the valves popped open and they were exposed to the vacuum of space. They had massive hemorrhaging in their brain. And these are the only people to have died in space. Other people have died going to space and returning. But these are the first people to have died uh, in space. So you know, since then, we haven't had any other deaths because of being exposed to the vacuum of space. But it's something you're going to constantly have to worry about. So even on Mars, where you have that 1% uh, atmosphere, 1% of what you have on Earth, that's not enough to save you from decompression problems. So you're always going to be worrying about this. And there's a scholar in the UK called Charles, named Charles Pickell who is concerned that this, this ability to essentially kill everybody by like putting a hole in your habitat is going to result in a lot of extra surveillance. So he's personally worried about liberty in space and concerns associated with additional surveillance to make sure nobody who gets angry and goes rogue kills everybody by like opening an, opening an airlock. But anyway, so you're going to have to worry about the atmosphere. You're also going to have to worry about radiation. And so this was really surprising to me when I, we started researching the book. So we have had people on space stations since 1971, the crew I just uh, showed you. So we've had people up there for like over 50 years. We've sent something like more than 600 astronauts to space. I thought that we had a pretty good handle on how radiation impacts human bodies. Uh, but so one, radiation in space is different than the radiation you encounter on Earth. So you have to worry about solar flares, solar particle events. So these are charged protons heading towards you. And you also have to worry about galactic cosmic radiation. And you know, I had assumed we had learned what happens, you know, how astronauts respond to that. But when the astronauts are on the International Space Station, they are orbiting, for the most part, within the protection offered by Earth's magnetosphere. So Earth's magnetosphere pres uh, results in there being two belts where radiation gets trapped. These are called the Van Allen belts. The International Space Station sometimes passes through those belts,
But for the most part, it doesn't. So radiation, uh, so astronauts in space are not encountering the radiation that you would encounter if you lived in a place like Mars or on the surface of the moon. Uh, so we don't actually know too much about how human bodies respond to space radiation. And we also have to worry about radiation impacting our equipment. So in 2003, there was an orbiter going around Mars and a solar particle event happened. So a bunch of protons shot, shot out from the sun. They happened to hit this uh, satellite and the device that was meant to measure radiation got completely just destroyed by the radiation. It shut down, it couldn't handle it, it stopped sending data. Like imagine being on the surface of Mars and being like, oh, our radiation sensor got fried with too much radiation. Uh, that would be sort of scary. So you have to worry about equipment malfunctioning, and you also have to worry about the fact that we don't really understand the risks. And in fact, we understand the risks so little that when you read review papers by scholars who study the impacts of space radiation on astronauts, they'll say things like, there's no definitive evidence that space radiation causes human cancer, but it's reasonable to assume that it can. So that's where we are right now in our understanding of this stuff. We, uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory recently got a device that can create galactic cosmic radiation, so we're starting to get some better data, but it's gonna be a while before we really have a handle on what can happen to humans uh, because of space radiation. Uh, also, what this means is that these beautiful visions of rotating space stations with the glass outer, outer parts are probably totally unrealistic. So uh, as far as I can tell, we're not going to want to have glass on our habitats because the radiation can get right in. So uh, a space architect named Brent, Brent Sherwood uh, wrote, the image of miraculous crystalline, pre crystalline pressure domes scattered about planetary surfaces affording a suburban populace with magnificent views of raw space is a baseless, albeit persistent, modern icon. Such architecture would bake the inhabitants in their parklands in strong sunlight while poisoning them with space radiation at the same time. So most of the proposals that I read involve taking regolith, so that dirt that you find on the surface of the moon and Mars, and covering your habitat with a few meters of it to protect yourself from space radiation. So it's gonna look not quite like most of the artistic renderings of uh, space settlements that perhaps we've seen in the past. Another problem is gravity. So we have evolved in the presence of uh, 1G, but when you're on the International Space Station, you're in free fall. So essentially you're experiencing no gravity. Astronauts exercise for something like two to three hours every day, five days a week, but they still have problems. So calf, calf muscles lose about 13% of their mass over the course of six months. Astronauts lose about 1% of the density of the, their hip bones every month. Uh, and that's, oh, for, that's for trips that last like six months to a year. The longest stay in space has been 437 days. So we don't really have a good handle on what happens to bones really long term when you're in space. So Mars has 40% of the gravity that you find on Earth. We don't know if that's going to be enough to completely make all of these hip problems go away or if that's going to maybe drop that 1% down to 0.1%. But now instead of you know, a couple months, maybe a year or two in space, we're talking about lifetimes in space. Uh, and so it, it's sort of unclear how our bones are gonna develop under those conditions and whether 40% gravity is gonna be enough to take care of the problem. Uh, another problem is that when you are in free fall, you're not getting the benefit of gravity pulling your fluids down, which our bodies sort of expect. So you get fluid shifts. Uh, and Susan Helms had this quote about how when you are experiencing these fluid shifts in space, uh, they make you look much better. You know, your wrinkles go away, your varicose veins go away, and I'm sure we're all feeling much better knowing that the millionaires who can afford trips to space are going to be even hotter than the rest of us uh, when they're up there in space. But there's actually a very real problem that we think is associated with these fluid shifts, and that is a problem related to vision. So when astronauts are in space, they, when they come back, they very often report that it's harder for them to see things that are close up. And astronauts that are 40 and older are usually prescribed glasses ahead of time in anticipation of the fact that they're going to need them while they're up in space. Uh, I think the, the glasses for 40 plus are called space anticipation glasses or SAG, which seems like a really mean acronym uh, to this 40 plus year old, but, uh, but anyway. So, and again, we don't know, is 40% gravity gonna be enough to, met, or to remove these vision problems? It's not quite clear yet. Uh, there have been some proposals for how to counteract these fluid shifts, 
So this is what I call the sucky sleeping bag. The idea is to try to create different sorts of pressure to pull your blood down. Uh, right now, we haven't quite figured these out. Every once in a while, people pass out while using them. Uh, and there's also a, uh, so, so these are, sorry, these are the sucky pants. There's also a sucky sleeping bag that you can sleep in to try to reduce some of these impacts on your eyes. Um, imagine a like sucky onesie for your baby or something. It's, it could be complicated. But again, maybe these sorts of problems will go away when you're on Mars and you've got 40% gravity. But on the six month trip to Mars, you might still have this stuff to worry about. Uh, there's kids in the audience, so we're not going to talk too much about reproduction in space. Uh, and I'll skip over this slide, uh, but there have been proposals for how to sort of make the physics of this problem work when you're in free fall. Uh, check out the book for a hilarious chapter on that. But uh, in terms of can you have babies or not, we really have very poor data on this question. So we have sent things like rodents to space, but it's usually like you shoot them in a rocket up to space and they're up there for some subset of their pregnancy and then they fall back to Earth and we see what happens. And sometimes the answer is not great. Sometimes we find out that their muscles that are required for contractions have atrophied and they have trouble pushing the litter out, or there'll be abnormalities that you don't see too often on Earth. But to be honest, we have low sample sizes and there's a lot of confounding factors because, you know, rodents are not equipped to understand that when the rocket is like going up into space that like this is a stressful thing, but you'll be fine. So you've got stress sort of coupled with all of the other stuff that they're encountering. Uh, so at the end of the day, I'd say we don't understand radiation, partial gravity, and how these factors are going to interact to impact whether or not we can have babies uh, in a place like Mars or not safely. Uh, and so when Musk says that he wants to send a million people to space in the next 30 years, biology research is slow. I don't actually know that we're going to be able to have the answer fast enough. And he said something to the effect of, well, you don't have to reproduce to get a million people. You can just send a million people. But like, you all have met people. If you have a million people, you're going to be learning about how babies work in space. And so I, I think we need to get the data before we start sending families up there. Uh, I'm also concerned with our, our current state of knowledge on closed loop ecosystems. So uh, if you're sending people to space for just short term, you can just send them with a lot of equipment. You can send them with carbon filters. But, you know, it's always going to be expensive to send mass to Mars, even with Elon Musk dropping the cost so rapidly. So eventually what you're going to need are systems that sort of recycle your waste. So you're going to want to have the carbon dioxide extracted from the atmosphere with plants, and you're going to want the plants to produce your oxygen. You're going to want to eat those plants. You're going to want to recycle your waste in there. You're going to want to save as much water as you can. These are complicated systems that we don't actually have a lot of experience with. Probably the most famous attempt at a closed loop ecosystem is Biosphere 2. So they, they called Biosphere 1 the Earth. And Biosphere 2 was their attempt to recreate the Earth in a dome. So they did a pretty great job of sealing things in. So this habitat was as sealed as the space shuttle. So the, the gases were staying in. They had to include two giant lungs to equalize the pressure as the temperature changes, changed inside and out. Uh, this sort of illustrates another reason why it's going to be difficult to have glass habitats, because they might not be strong enough to withstand pressure changes. Uh, but, you know, this experiment actually went pretty well. Two people, or sorry, eight people went in for a period of two years. Eight people came out. They lost uh, 10 to 18 percent of their body mass, and they weren't particularly large people to begin with, but they were able to make enough food to stay alive. There were psychology problems. They split into two hateful factions and were literally spitting on each other at one point. Uh, but if the experiment had run multiple times, we think they would have figured out some stuff. So some of the problems were trivial, like they just hadn't been growing their banana plants long enough for them to start fruiting. So the next two year cycle, they would have had bananas. Uh, and so, you know, if you had a system like this where you were constantly testing and retesting, that could be helpful. But this system got shut down after two years because of mismanagement. And Steve Bannon is one of the people who took it over. That was a weird surprise while we were doing our research. Uh, but anyway, Steve Bannon was one of the guys who helped take it over. There have been other closed loop experiments. Uh, China has a facility called the Lunar Palace, and they're also trying to recycle as many things as they can. They've actually been really successful. They supplement some things like, uh, like spices to make the foods a little bit more exciting. But where they are currently is they recently ran a simulation where they had three big guys in the simulation 
they had too much carbon dioxide and not enough oxygen, so they had to switch out two big guys for two small women. And so obviously that's not something you could do on Mars. So there's still some tinkering we need to do with these equations to figure out, you know, how many plants do you need to support how many people? And we'd like to figure these kinds of things out before we're, we're on Mars and, you know, bringing kids with us. Uh, and another lesson that we learned from Biosphere and from these other closed loop ecosystems is that it takes a lot of time to run these facilities. And we also know this from like Bios 1, 2, and 3, which were Soviet Union closed loop ecosystem experiments. There have been experiments in Japan. Essentially, when you're trying to keep these systems working, most of your time every day is dedicated to tending your plants and sort of checking on the system. And so we, when we were reading the space settlement literature, we were kind of shocked to find a number of people saying, like, look, in early settlements, everybody is going to need to be doing a ton of work. And we're not going to be able to handle having anyone around who can't do a ton of work. So we might have to change what we think of as valuable human life. And sometimes people will just not talk about these problems at all. But when people do talk about it, their answers are kind of horrifying. Like, I don't really want a backup of humanity that doesn't bring with us the progress that we've made in human rights as we sort of start, you know, plan B for our species. So uh, my husband and I are excited about the idea of sort of slowing down, figuring out how these systems work on Earth, figuring out uh, how to get the data on reproduction in space. Uh, and once we have that sort of stuff figured out, and we've got a little bit of a buffer where you can handle, like if somebody can no longer uh, participate in the gardening, that you can have people there who will support them and help them like we have here on Earth. That seems to me like one of the great things about our species. Uh, so we're, what can we do to learn about this stuff? So in addition to things like making more closed loop ecosystems on Earth, you could go to the moon to figure out a bunch of this stuff. So most of the people who are excited about the moon, they're not excited about settling the moon, but they're excited about using the moon as a place to learn about how to live in space. So the moon has a couple benefits. One of them is that it's close. So whereas it takes about six months to get to Mars, you can get to the moon in just a couple days. So if something catastrophic happens, you can come back to Earth or you can get a resupply ship, perhaps in enough time to solve the problem. Uh, the moon is still a difficult environment, though. It's a complete vacuum. So Mars has 1% atmosphere. The moon has none. The moon is also covered in uh, a thin layer of jagged uh, rocks and glass called regolith. And you have this on Mars also. On the moon, it's even a little bit more fine. And you have to worry about breathing it in. So there's some concern that we might have uh, problems with stone grinders disease which is this disease you get, you get when you breathe in small, sharp particles, and they scar your lungs over and over again. And over time, it gets difficult to breathe. Uh, these are also electrostatically charged, so they tend to cling to equipment. They're also highly abrasive, so they also tend to like wear down equipment relatively quickly. Uh, the moon has two weeks of night, so the equivalent of two weeks on Earth. That's how long the nighttime is. That's also how long the day is. And you get massive temperature swings during that time. So it's a very harsh environment, but it's a place that we can go to sort of learn if our equipment can last for two years, for example. But you know, even though if you look at the moon, you might say that that looks pretty homogenous, at least there's a lot of space. Uh, there's actually a lot of variability in the good places that you would want to go on the moon. So the places we're probably going to want to go initially are the poles. And so the poles are great because one, they have craters where there's water in the form of ice. There's not a lot of ice on the moon, but you can get some in these craters. And there's not tons of it in the craters, but there would certainly be enough to start like a research station or a small settlement. In addition, on the outside of that crater, the rims are up high enough that even though it's about two weeks of night at the equator, if you put solar panels up on the rims, you can get, or you can get light for your solar panels something like 90% of the time. They're called the peaks of eternal light. That's a little bit overselling it. They're the peaks of near eternal light. But these are really good spots. But so the peaks of eternal light are something like 1 100th of a billionth of the surface area of the moon. So there's not a lot of them. And so these areas are places where you can sort of imagine if more than one country, say China and the US, wanted to start research stations or space settlements, that these are places that we could end up sort of scrambling for territory for. Uh, which brings us to the topic of space law. What, what are the rules governing what you're allowed to do in space? 
So most of the major international space law, which is a thing that existed, and I was just tickled to discover that there are space lawyers, they don't like it when you laugh about their career, uh, but they're usually pretty good sports. Uh, most of the treaties that govern space are 50-year-old documents. The main one is the Outer Space Treaty from 1967. It's been ratified by all of the major space powers, so it, all of the major space powers are bound by the text in this document. There were three follow-up documents that just sort of elaborate on the Outer Space Treaty, but the main article that's relevant for space settlement is this one, which essentially says you cannot claim sovereignty over uh, land in space. So you can't, for, you know, for example, when our Apollo astronauts landed on the moon and we put that uh, flag down, we were not saying this now belongs to the United States because we had signed the Outer Space Treaty and we knew that you can't claim sovereignty over things in space. But it's a little bit unclear about what you can do regarding resources and who gets to use what parts of space. Uh, so, you know, we, we talked about how the craters are places where you've got like the best habitat. If the United States gets there first or some companies from the United States get there first and they start using those resources, we could essentially say like, look, we're not, we're not moving. We're going to stay here. We're going to use these resources. There's nothing you can really do about it. We're not claiming sovereignty, but we don't plan on leaving. And there's no system to say, like, you have to take turns. And that kind of feels OK when you hear me say it, but it feels less OK if, if I were to say, what if China gets there first? And then China says that you're not allowed to use this land. And you know, if we get there first, maybe it has one feeling. But we don't have a system for determining who gets to go where and when. Additionally, we don't have a system Oh yeah, so you can, assort, you can sort of get these like quasi-sovereignty situations where people say, hey, okay, we're not sovereign, but we're just gonna like hang out here and maybe some of our soldiers are here, but they're here for science, uh, but we're not gonna leave. And so you can imagine there being sort of tension when you've got, or got different states sort of competing for the best locations. There was an attempt to sort of clarify who can use what resources in space. This was the uh, 1979 Moon Agreement. There are some space lawyers who are very mad at me because I call it a failed document. They argue that it's been ratified by enough nations that it should count. Uh, but it doesn't bind the behavior of any of the major space players, so it's not going to stop uh, anyone, anyone like China or the US from, from doing what they want in space. Uh, the Artemis Accords attempted to clarify the United States' interpretation of what you can do with resources in space. Uh, and it essentially says that our interpretation is that you can extract resources, you can sell those resources, and that is a thing that's very different than sovereignty, and our interpretation is that that's legal. And this document has now been signed by about 20 other nations, and some of them are major spacefaring nations. So this is starting to sort of clarify what you're allowed to do in space. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's still, you can still have this situation where you've got this, like, race. If we get there before China, uh, you can imagine that increasing tensions between two countries that are already kind of tense. The Artemis Accords also have a clause in there called safety zones, which do totally make sense. So the idea is that, you know, if you land and you set up a research station, you can say that people are not allowed within, you know, they haven't quite figured out what the zones will be, but say something like 100 meters. And the idea here is that if a rocket lands near your habitat, because you're in a vacuum of space, there's nothing to slow the particles down, regolith could slam into your habitat and, and cause a lot of problems. So these safety zones are meant to sort of keep people out so that you don't have problems with your you know, space base, for example. But they do sort of feel quasi-sovereign. So you're landing somewhere and essentially saying, I'm not saying this is mine, but nobody can come within 100 meters of here. Uh, so my husband and I are a little bit concerned that we are kind of setting things up for a race between China and the United States. And you know, there are other... Uh, places on the planet where technology has sort of recently opened them up to human use. So for example, Antarctica and the deep seabed are places where technology has recently made it possible for us to extract resources. And multiple countries have been able to coexist in these spaces without, uh, without extracting resources, but also without going to war and prioritizing science and peace. So it kind of depends on what you're excited about, but I would like to see some clarity about who's allowed to go where. And to return to the hot tub, you know, it's not necessarily clear to me anymore that the people who are going to space are the only people who are taking the risk if they go to space. So if you go to space and you set up a space station on one of the poles and China wants to use that area also and you've increased tension between two nuclear powers, 
that doesn't necessarily seem like a, a great situation to me. So whereas the first Cold War was all about getting to the moon, sort of touching the moon and then leaving, if we have a new Cold War with China, now we're going and we're you know, essentially doing something like a land grab. And you can imagine tensions increasing a lot more over that. Uh, additionally, the more people who have the ability to move mass over Earth's gravity well, the greater the probability that somebody accidentally loses control of the mass or some terrorist sends some mass towards the Earth. This is a problem that Carl Sagan and Robert Ostro were concerned about. In particular, they were concerned about our ability to move asteroids and that a species that was able to move asteroids away from Earth could also accidentally or purposefully move asteroids towards Earth. So, uh, so it's not clear to me that, that going into space doesn't have implications for everybody else because there are risks if we don't do this well. Uh, and that, that's pretty much my, uh, my point. So I think there's a lot of things that we don't, we don't know yet. We need a lot more research on biology. We need a lot more research on closed loop ecosystems. I'd like to see more clarity on the law. Uh, so I don't think it's something that we can never do, but it's something that I would prefer to see us do slowly. I'd like to see us have research stations on the moon where we have, for example, rodent colonies that live out many generations and see if they do okay under partial gravity in the presence of space radiation. I'd like to see closed loop ecosystems run many times so we can figure out, you know, how many wheat plants do you need to support how many astronauts? And these experiments are gonna be run on the scale of biology and ecology, which is slow. It's hard to get data quickly in these fields. And so, uh, you know, when Musk says that by 2050, we're going to have people, a million people on the moon, I'm not sure by 2050, we're going to be sure that radiation and partial gravity are safe for people on the moon. So uh, I would like to see us do all of this really interesting, fascinating research. It's exciting, I'm not a downer. This is cool stuff that we still need to figure out. But, uh, but I'd like to see us be slow about starting families on the moon. Okay, thanks. Also, if you can keep, I don't know, Lauren, if you're somebody's keep an eye on the questions from online, just let me know. Oh, so we have a whole chapter on psychology. The answer was kind of surprising to us. So we thought for sure that being in space, like you'd immediately get space madness or, you know, there'd be some interesting psychological uh, findings. But to be honest, we didn't find many cases where people had mental health problems. More often than not, what we discovered was that uh, astronauts report having better mental health than the rest of the population. And that could be a selection thing. So, you know, first of all, they're selected for being, you know, great physical and mental specimens. Then they are uh, given a lot of training on how to deal with harsh environments. They talk to psychiatrists pretty regularly while they're up there. They have access to family and foods. There's this great 1300 page handbook that tells you how to keep them happy. Uh, and so they actually do pretty well, but also they're not totally honest about how they're doing. And so if you read memoirs, they will very regularly say, I was depressed, but I didn't tell the psychiatrist. Because if you're honest about that stuff, you might not get another trip. We also found, uh, so Mike Mullane was an astronaut in the shuttle era. This was back when uh, records were more paper than digital. He took out the pages, pages associated with the recent medical incident he had. Uh, so you very regularly find stories about people lying because incentives are like, I mean, this is the job that everybody wants. Like, who doesn't want to be an astronaut? They finally get this job, and if they admit that maybe they thought they were going to have a heart attack last night, which was an example we came across in our memoir, uh, then they don't get to go to space. And so I'm not sure we have great data, but the data we do have suggests that if you go to space with appropriate psychological support, you don't do that much worse than people on Earth. So that's encouraging. And the one thing I would comment too, though, is that we don't have a lot of experience with the time delay and how that affects. Yes, you can do yeah. a time delay experiment with a, an analog, mm -hmm. but then you don't have all the other conditions around you that make you know that you're in an experiment. Whereas if you're on Mars and you're trying to talk to your wife or your husband or your psychiatrist, there's a 20 minute delay. That could be very frustrating, you know. You try, try hanging on to your bank for 20 minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so these, are, these are other experiments that have to come into so that we can really understand the whole scope of how these things work. And again, as, as Kelly's saying, the numbers are small. So a hand up here. Oh, is there a hand up here? So, so uh, I'm a bit of a movie buff as far as sci-fi is concerned. Has Hollywood done a good job of kind of fleshing out all these issues that you're bringing up? Interstellar, 
So I am unfortunately not a movie buff, and so I haven't seen most of these. Uh, I, I I watched The Martian, and I thought they did a pretty good job, but like, you know, he didn't remove the perchlorates from the soil before he grew his potatoes. I mean, there was, a, I don't know, I'm willing to like jump into a sci-fi environment, and as long as they follow the rules that they've set for their environment, I just go with it. Uh, so I, I don't, I'm not too critical when I let myself watch a movie, which is this not- This is where I get to tell um, The Expanse they get closer than anybody. It's a series. Yes, I've seen the, the problem with Interstellar is the bookcase, and the trouble with gravity is how you change orbits with a fire extinguisher. But we'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> the Expanse guys liked our book. They provided a blur. Right. Yeah. Expanse, no, the Expanse at least tries, and I think they, they get some stuff, as you know, wrong, but they do a lot of good stuff here. Yeah. So is the sci-fi critique going to be the next book? Say that again? I was just following up. Is the, is the sci-fi critique going to be the next book? No, Neil deGrasse Tyson's pretty good at that stuff. He's got that, that niche covered. Before, I'm going to go behind you, uh, Rin, and then I'll come to you. No, no, behind you, sir, and then we'll come to you next. Regarding your closed loop uh, biosphere what would you like to learn in the science and experiment? So I, I would love, Biosphere 2 was so big that it's hard for me to imagine exactly what you could learn from it. There were so many pieces that I don't think you could break it down into usable information. So I'd love to see something like Biosphere on like, you know, half an acre with one person. And once you've got that working, scale up to, you know, a couple acres with four people or something like that. And just get more specific information about how you can recycle waste and grow enough plants for subsistence farming. Um, does that kind of answer the question? I guess I'd like to see us scale down and do a lot more of it. Replication. I was thinking about 1492 and and that worked great for everyone. Yeah. For everyone, yeah, that's right. yes. Uh, there was no question. Uh, well, should they have been worried about some of these things? I mean, millions of people died, right? From the diseases that they spread, and so I, I mean, I guess is the question: Should we have not explored America? We've made progress. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we should be a little bit more careful now that we can learn from those lessons. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think there's an exploration question there too, though. But I think that um, the bo the bottom line is, yes, you might not. I think maybe this is more you were asking, but one way of asking it is. You go without a lot of resources. Of course, they could hunt. They could do all sorts of stuff to feed themselves. Mm -hmm. So, as we explore, and I, I mean, I think what you're saying is you've covered a lot of this. Actually, is you know the exploration is good, but you're not going to send a million people before you send one or two yeah. or four, and then learn some of these problems coming in. And then, mm -hmm. as you said, the resources. You know, the resources. It takes a long time to build up that human fertilizer to to grow your potatoes. You yeah. Know? yeah. Okay. There was a question here, and then we'll come up to the back. Yeah. Are there any technology solutions for the irrigation problem? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, it's really difficult to continue to be able to do that. So the question is, are there promising solutions for the radiation problem? Uh, and, you know, I think it could be as simple as just putting enough regolith over your habitat or storing your water around the habitat. There have been proposals for, uh, you know, using electricity to sort of like bounce some of the radiation off, but there's some kinds of radiation that will still get through. Maybe that's what you were getting with with the superconductor question. Um, and so the proposals that I read suggested that in the near term, that would be so energetically expensive at a time when we really aren't going to have a lot of excess energy, especially until we're able to bring like a lot of nuclear reactors with us, that that probably won't be a first line solution, but that might be something once we have enough energy that we could we could look into down the line. <laughs> I don't have a hot tub, uh, no, but uh, so, so is the question, could we do things like bring uh, or other species that could impact or help impact our microbiome to improve our mental health and stuff? So I, how do you go to that point? How does that impact the ethics of 
So I don't think we understand the gut-brain axis well enough to be able to do a lot of manipulation to benefit things like mental health or to keep us healthy in an environment that's so unlike uh, Earth. And so, you know, on the International Space Station, they regularly have problems with, like, mold growing behind the panels, uh, and they've got, like, all kinds of weird microbiome stuff going on up there. Uh, I don't really know the answer to your question. Uh, and in terms of ethics, I mean, people take probiotics all the time, and we don't think too much about it. Uh, but maybe I'm not understanding your question completely. Ah, so ethics of human research, I mean, it, could, it certainly could slow things down. So you often get people uh, proposing that genetic engineering might be a way to make our species, for example, more radiation resistant. And so now you get into questions about gene editing. Uh, my, my take right now is that we don't understand how the human body responds to cancer well enough to know which genes to tinker with. So I don't think that's a near-term possibility. Uh, and I suspect that if we do figure out what genes are responsible for radiation resistance, it's going to be a lot of them, which would be hard to tinker with also. Um, but, the, but there are some folks arguing that genetic engineering is how humans will persist better in space, which does open up a whole slew of ethical questions that I'm probably not prepared to, uh, to open. We did avoid that in the book. If you send a million people to live on Mars, you're doing your own experiment right there on the genetic engineering over time. Yeah. Um, any questions? Oh, there's a question. Could you, would you mind reading it out? Yeah. Uh, so Marlon Stanley asked, what depth of regolith would be necessary to shield from habitat from all forms of radiation? What depth of regolith would be necessary to shield a habitat from all forms of radiation? So uh, I don't know that we know the answer yet. I think it depends on what you make your habitat out of. So for example, there's some hydrogenated boron nanotubes, like they capture a certain kind of radiation, and maybe that would cut down on the amount of regolith you would need to pile over it. I've also read some papers saying that like the shape of your habitat impacts how much radiation gets in and how much spallation happens. So spallation is when radiation hits your habitat and creates a cascade of new radiation that enters your habitat. And so I, I think the answer might differ depending on what you make your habitat out of and its shape and it's complicated. Professor, thank you for your wonderful lecture. Welcome to the great state of Texas. Um, what I, I see on, on the cover of your, you and your, your husband's book, a subterranean uh, habitat. Is that yours and your husband's um, idea of the preferred habitat that makes the most sense? And would you, would you elaborate on what that habitat Yes, you see, I see that dome. What is the purpose of that dome, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Sure, so partly this was just like a fun artistic thing. But, so my husband and I are really excited about lava tubes. So lava tubes, you find them on the moon and Mars. They're areas where lava passed through once, and as it passed through underground, it hardens the outer area. Uh, and as the lava sort of passed out, it left a tube that was hardened around the outside. Uh, and if you're inside of those tubes, you get less temperature swings, you're protected from some of the radiation, you've got some protection from like stuff, micrometeorites and stuff like puncturing your habitat. Uh, and lava tubes just sound really cool to us. And so this was sort of an underground habitat sort of with lava tubes in mind. Uh, and then the dome up there was, was a place where you could maybe do some of your uh, agriculture work. You'd have to worry about shielding your workers from radiation while they were up there. Uh, but you could get, you know, some benefit of the sunlight. Uh, and some of it is just silly. I think he's got, he tried to do something, some play on Walmart. Uh, we read a bunch of uh, studies uh, talking about what kind of protein sources you might have in space. And so we've got a cricket ranch in there because people were saying we'll be able to bring crickets more easily than uh, something like cows. Uh, but once we get cell cultures, then you could, you know, have beef without needing to raise an entire cow. Um, but yeah, well, it was trying to be funny and cute, but also we're excited about lava tubes. Thank you. Oh, this will be my last question. But if they can uh, uh, make fusion, basically the energy source, would that accelerate? If we could have portable fusion reactor reactors, that would be awesome. That would be awesome here too. Would it solve? Uh, yeah. Would it solve a lot of the problems? Yeah. Um, Do you think it could? So can I, do you mind if I ask? Sure. So I was, at, I was in DC a couple of weeks ago, with us. I was, that was the topic. And mod, modular, modular 
nuclear power plants are supposed to be the answer for everything, except we can't make them yet. There's a couple of companies trying to make them. But also, one of the things that allows you to get them to space is you like if you build if you build a nuclear plant, if we were to build one in Rice Campus, we'd have to surround it by 30 feet of concrete or more to protect everybody in the campus from the radiation. You cannot take that 30 foot concrete dome to space with you, so you'd either have to build it out of regolith again or something, or you have to have it somewhere away where you're not actually because we're talking about supporting humans. But he's talking about fusion, not fission, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fusion. Well, fusion. Well, fusion is a whole other story. But these, they, they, we're not going to create a modular fusion reactor. No, 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 I know. But if that's Fu solved, well, fusion, would, uh, for me, the fusion thing would be much better for the Earth because then you just mine the, the helium-3 on the moon and you create a fusion reactor for there. And that's a big topic, and there's a lot of interesting things going on there. Um, we don't know how to do that. And, and I think that's one of the resources. That when the Chinese talk about the space economy, they talk about multiple tens of trillions. And I think a lot of that has to do with the energy potential. Because if you think long term, right. at some point we'll have a fusion reactor that can use helium-3. And there's a lot of it up there. And so you add that into the equation. But anyway, these are all speculative stuff. The key thing is energy is required. <laughs> However you do it, and I think the comment that Kelly made about dust and so on, right. um, it becomes an issue for solar, of course. I have a feeling that uh, energy is the one thing that we always have to have in order to progress. Andrew, did you want to come in? Two comments, if I may. <laughs> so the one thing you said uh, about the rush to go to space, for me it's quite simple. It takes too long not to get. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, we wrote this book because we were hoping it was going to happen in our lifetime. I stretched on to build the first Scottish wisdom that I on Mars, so we need to get there. Okay. Um, but you also said about we shouldn't try and colonize Mars until we have all the resources in place. But the reality, that's, that's how I took it. Okay. But to me, the reality is that you never have all the resources in place. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an iterative process. But is it not better to build that colony on Mars as a safety gap, uh, or as a safe, safe stop, um, even if it doesn't have everything, if it has enough to survive, it's still preserving humanity to a large extent. It may not be humanity with all the modcoms, but we'll still be preserving humanity. To me, it's better to try and do something than to keep waiting forever. Sure, yeah, so and I don't want to see us wait forever either, uh, but I, I think it's not an all or nothing proposition. Like, you know, you learn to swim before you jump in the deep end, but you don't have to be Michael Phelps before you jump in the deep end. And so I think that there's more that we need to learn before we're ready to send people up there and say, go have babies. But I'm sure that when we get there, there's gonna be things we hadn't thought of. There's going to be challenges that, you know, that are surprises to us. And so, you know, I, I hope that in the not too distant future, we have sorties out there. So we've got astronauts out there testing out equipment, uh, trying to make propellant and stuff like that. Uh, but I, I think that a self-sustaining settlement on Mars you know, you're going to be, need to be able to make like computer chips on Mars to be self-sustaining. And I think we're, I can't see how we're close to that in the near term. Chips Act. Pardon? No, chips Act. Chips Act? That's the Chips Act. That's the big. Oh, 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 got it. <laughs> right, right. But that's in the U.S. <laughs> Any, yes, sir. So given your survey of all the technologies and different rates of, I don't know, data acquisition, and like do you have guess or an expectation for when, like a revised expectation for when this is going to happen? So it, it depends so much on, on political stuff and social stuff. So, you know, if tomorrow the United States decided this is the next space race and we have to get there before, you know, we've got to get to Mars before China lands humans on the moon or something, then we could, we'd do it real fast. I don't know if we'd get all the data that I'm hoping Great. that we so get. Centuries, we're talking... I, I mean, I, I think we're probably not too far away from getting boots on the moon. Like, I think we can get people there and back in that two-year trip. I, you know, there was recently a report through the National Academies saying maybe that would be really like a lethal amount of radiation, but we'll have the astronauts sign a waiver saying that they know this could be really bad. Um, but, you know, I don't think we're too far away from getting to Mars, but I don't know how far away we are from getting to a settlement, and if we do it fast... I think we're more likely to, you know, lose a lot of people or have sort of catastrophic consequences. I don't really know how long that's going to take.
But I, another problem is how do you make these things profitable along the way? So like how do you get the data that we need on reproduction while making money? You know, there's Spaceborne United is trying to make, they're hoping that they'll be able to get some patents from in vitro fertilization in space. It's hard for me to imagine, I hope I'm wrong, but unless you can find ways to make these things profitable, it's gonna be hard to get from one step to another. That's assuming like a more decentralized process where the geopolitics isn't driving it, where there's not a central government sort of play. Yeah. So what, what path do you think is more likely to make? I mean, I, I hope that we keep getting like small steps with private companies getting involved, but maybe with a little bit more international guidance about what's what's allowed and what's not. Uh, I mean, I, yeah. I don't, I don't really know. Well, any questions online to finish? I mean, I think, thank you. And I think, um, I mean, I think what we're learning, you know, from Kelly's talk too, is this, this isn't about exploration isn't worth it. It's about being realistic about what we're trying to achieve in this, in this time scales that we're taking. And that could be, it could be a thousand years. It could be a hundred years if technology takes off. But the point is, um, this way, if we're going to do this, we have to know what we're doing, and I think that's the, the kind of key message. So I think for me anyway, you know, there's a lot to think about in terms of, you know, how we bring it. We, we so often address these problems one at a time, but we realize that you might solve one, but then there's an, another hundred to, to go. And so putting it all together and getting people to think about what it might take, I think, is a key element to why we have these discussions and why I'm very grateful for all you guys coming out to the talks that you come out to so that you can start thinking and, and adding to the conversation. So with that, um, I thought really enjoyed tonight's talk. Thank you, uh, everybody, for being here.